was a house that I had and and you know I was selling it in the middle and I went upstairs to turn the lights on and then all of a sudden from downstairs I heard like all this commotion and breaking glasses and all these kinds of things and I went downstairs and there was like 10 peacocks in the living room <laughs> where do you believe that your marketing dollars should be spent is it videos people are doing the virtual tours the drones Give us a sense of what you believe in, what you stand behind, and what you would recommend to, I'm sure, some agents in the room who are constantly marketing their their properties. Hello, Josh. We are so excited to have you tonight. I am excited to be here. Welcome, everyone. Ooh, Nantucket, Jessica. Washington, Larchmont. I was just at Salt and Straw the other night, Dan Lerman. Um, fun group we have. So welcome everyone. For some, this may be your first session with Josh or it may be your second. We are in the midst of Josh's five-part series, The Art of Luxury Real Estate. So today's topic is how to price and market the listing. Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this is a very important topic as it pertains to real estate. I can imagine that pricing and marketing is what results in a sale. So very exciting topic. We are going to split this conversation up into three topics that we'll go through. So we're going to start with number one, which is pricing strategy. Number two is going to be marketing do's and don'ts. And number three is going to be personal branding as a broker. So as we go through these topics, we will also take some time in between to interact with you guys, bring you up on stage so you can have your questions answered by Josh and you guys can chat face to face. So do not forget to leave your questions and comments in the comment bar um, and we will take it from here. So Number one, I think, Josh, something that I would love to know, I'm sure everyone would love to know as a start, is what is the current landscape right now in the market? Can you just give us an overview of what's going on, whether that is specific to LA, general overview of the market? What's the kind of the vibe right now? Well, I can, you know, I can pretty much generally only speak about LA because that's my specialty. Um, and I can, what I can tell you is that the market in LA is on fire. Interest rates are climbing, but I think people are smart enough to realize that if you compare interest rates today with what they were, let's say, oh my God, I don't know, 10 years ago, they're still like a quarter of the price of what they were. So yeah, are they going up? Yes. Um, is it going to be more expensive to buy a house in the near future, meaning your mortgage payment? Yes. But what I tell people is that they're not going down. So if you don't lock it in right now, you're going to be priced out of the market. And number two, you know, people are often concerned with, well, should I buy right now? The market seems really, really heavy. What if prices crash or whatever? Um, valid, valid question. Um, but the thing you have to keep in mind is this, you know, whatever you buy today in 10 years from now is going to be worth a hell of a lot more regardless. So if you're staying there for a long time and you can afford your mortgage payments and you're not concerned about, you know, you're only concerned about, well, I want to get the best deal. Prices are still going up. If you, if you wait, you're going to price yourself out of the market and interest rates are going to keep climbing. You just got to just bite the bullet and just do it. So it sounds like there are just no deals right now. Is no, that fair to say? No deals anymore. When somebody says to me, oh, I want a deal, I go, good luck, get in line. Today, it's just about getting a house. There's so many right. price bidding wars today. And like there's 50 offers on houses. It's like, how can I get the house? If you're coming right. in with the mentality of, oh, um, I, I, you know, I really want a house, but I want the best deal possible. You're not going to have a chance. You, you can't look at it that way. You have to, the goal is to just get the property. Totally. And in terms of inventory, are we seeing more houses constantly coming on the market? Is it a little bit dry? Is it just so hot that things are just on for a day or two and then snatched up? What's the inventory looking there like? There is no inventory. That's the right. problem. That's why there's 50 people bidding on houses at a time. And that's why, you know, all my clients are tr trying to do anything they can to secure the list, to secure the deal. And, you know, when you're going against 50 people, how do you get the deal? You know, that's a whole different, you know, we can go into that too. So in terms of pricing strategy, do you kind of err on the side of 
let's list it on the lower end. Let's get a lot of traffic. Let's get a lot of buzz. Or is it like, let's kind of list it and see how it goes at a premium. What's your strategy? like? Same thing is if you're buying something at auction, if you're going to buy a painting at auction and, and the, and there's a, um, an estimate of X, Y, Z to X, Y, Z, but you know, the starting bid is well below that you're going to get really excited and you're going to start to want to bid up and you're going to bid up and you're going to, and then you get really emotionally into it. And then you end up paying more than you would have had you, you know, just they had given you a price and they said, you, you can have the house at this price. You're going to get really mentally into it and you're going to bid up. And I'm saying this is the benefit of a seller. So for, for a seller, you want to price your property at a point like, let's say the house is $3 million. You put it at $2,995,000 and it's pro- probably end up selling for 3233. Gotcha. And so I think that brings us to our next question in regards to the seller. I can imagine. You walk into someone's house for a listing appointment. Everyone thinks that they have the best property on the planet and that it deserves X, Y, Z price. How do you manage expectations? Do you sometimes have to have tough conversations where you just look at them and say, you know what, that's just not realistic. We're not going to get that. How do you go about managing these relationships and conversations when it comes to pricing? Well, it's a problem because, you know, I'm going up against 10 other people that are trying to get the listing. And you know that the person that gives you the highest price is the one who's going to get the listing because human nature is to give the listing to whoever gives you the highest number. Right. So how I defute that is I, I go ahead and I say to them, look, you're going to interview 10 people. And I guarantee you eight of them are going to tell you some crazy number because they want the listing. And then six months from now, you're going to call me when the house hasn't sold and you're going to come back to me. And then I, so I tell them ahead of time, I say, look, are you, you, you seem like an educated person. Do you really want to have this on the market for six months? You can't list it with, you know, at a price where there's room to negotiate price where you're going to get multiple offers. And then there, you don't have to deal with negotiation and you just bid up. That's the way to do it. Right. So we just want to drive it up, start in a realistic place and get as much activity and as many people through the door as possible, basically. Cool. Okay. So kind of a fun question that I'm just curious about. You have been to millions of homes. Maybe that's slightly an exaggeration, but tons of homes. What is your favorite type of property to sell? You know, I like more of the classical architecture. I like more of the, um, I'm less interested in the uh, contemporary Bird Street homes. I'm more interested in the classic Beverly Hills, 1920s homes or the 1930s homes. That's really my, that's, that's my passion. And to that point, how much do you actually think that taste level and architecture plays a part when pricing a home? Um, it, it doesn't necessarily, look, as long as it's in good, it, like there's so many different styles, but as long as the house is done in good taste, whether it's my style or not, a house is saleable. It's when a house is not, you know, when a house is just frankly ugly, <laughs> that's, you know, when it's a little bit more difficult or when you have a seller that thinks their house is stunning and you're trying to, in a right. nice way, tell them that it looks like dog shit. <laughs> um, that's when it's a problem. Do you have just off the top of your head, a funny story of like something that went totally awry or a listing appointment, or you walked into a house and you're just like, Oh God, I, I can't take on this listing for any reason or another. I mean, there's so many times I've come to houses where they've just been so atrociously decorated and I just right. don't know how to sell it because I don't know how to fake it. I don't know how to sell something when the, and, you know, believe in it and make the buyer feel like this is the best house ever when it's so hideous. So I, I mean, I don't know if there's a particular story, but, but, you know, I've had just, I don't know, there was a house that I had and, and, you know, I was selling it in the middle and I went upstairs to turn the lights on. And then all of a sudden from downstairs, I heard like all this commotion and breaking glasses and all these kinds of things. And I went downstairs and there was like 10 peacocks in the living room. <laughs> and it was in, it was actually in the, in, it was, um, it was in the flats of Beverly Hills. And I was like, what is going on here? And, and the seller didn't, she's, she forgot to tell me ahead of time that they, have a bunch of peacocks and so i'm trying to show the house and there's all these peacocks and i don't know how to show a house with a bunch of peacocks and then they're breaking things and and all this you know so i was trying to do the showing and i am like i don't know we have visitors i don't don't know what to say that's hysterical um how did that sale go did the peacocks come with the property or did they leave with the owners i don't know what happened to the peacocks i don't think the new buyers wanted them okay 
So um, I think Dan asked an interesting question. I'd love to bring Dan up, please. Dan, unmute yourself, please, and ask us your question. Chloe, you're so good at this. Uh, thanks for moderating today. Um, yeah, my question, I, I can't see the exact word, but basically, Josh, it's, I wonder why, since this the kind of underpricing and creating a bidding war strategy seems like the way to go, why did it take till basically 2020 for people to realize that? I feel like on every old show I watch, houses used to sell for below asking. Good question. I, I, I don't know. I've been telling my clients for years to price something for what it's worth and get multiple offers, but they never listened to me. They always just wanted to price it high and there'd be room for negotiation and whatnot. But I can't tell you why. I don't know. That's always been my theory. You were ahead of your time. I guess I was ahead of my time. Makes sense. Okay, cool. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Dan. Um, great question. I'd love to bring up Diego who asked, what would you say is the general turnaround? Sorry, your question went away, but you can ask us yourself, Diego, between market shifts and please unmute yourself. Hey guys, good afternoon. Yeah, no, my question is Josh, just, you know, what, I mean, I'm sure there's no typical, but what the, what the typical timeline would be that you say, you see that the market switches, you know, right now it's, just, it's a very strong seller's market. There's no inventory. How long do you foresee before it, switches back oh nobody can tell you that i it, it, you know there's no answer generally cycles are six to seven years but we've technically been, been in the longest cycle in history the, the market turned around in 2000 or, i want to say 2011 maybe 2012 and now we're into the 10th year so who knows i don't know it's hard to tell you that nobody knows but this is the longest cycles are generally six to seven years and this has been ongoing all right cool thank you yeah no problem Thanks, Diego. I'd love to bring up Monda, who asked a great question about competing against other agents, which I know, Josh, you touched on earlier, but Monda, go ahead and please ask Josh your question again. Hey, Josh. Yeah, so in my market, so I'm in Boise, Idaho, and we have like 10,000 agents in a very small, I think our population is like 750,000 for the greater metro area. So when I know I'm going up against like new agents who are willing to reduce their commission in that pricing strategy conversation almost immediately just to get the listing. And you know that maybe a seller already wants to overprice the home and then the commission like conversation comes into play. How do you handle that objection? Well, I mean, the first question you'd have to ask yourself is, do you want the listing? Is this a person that's overpricing their home that you're never going to be able to sell, that they're unreasonable? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. In our market, it's so hard to say because, I mean, I know Boise, Idaho has been on like a ton of like the national, like everybody's fleeing California and going to affordable towns like Boise, Idaho. And so pricing is so weird here right now that we're still kind of like, oh, that's a, throw a dart at the number that you want and let's shoot for it and see if it sells. And nine times out of 10 right now, like they're getting the price that they want. So in my mind, the comps don't support that. And I would never really encourage a seller to price at a, a number that's much higher than what the comps support. But a lot of the times these, I've lost out on listings because I was unwilling to go for the price that they wanted and they still got the price even more than what they wanted. So now as I'm going into those listing appointments, I'm kind of like, well, <laughs> I mean, we can try as long as we have a strategy in place if, it, if you don't see the traction that you want within a certain amount of time. But then I'm always unsure of how to handle the commission piece when that pricing strategy is starting to be a little weird. Well, what I usually say is I'll say to the, um, I'll say to the seller, I'll say, okay, you're going to interview 10 people here. And I'm sure half of them will discount their commission. And that's great. But do you really want those people selling your house or representing you. I mean, you get what you pay for. And, you know, there's people that will sell their house for a point. I mean, but do you really want that person? They're going to show up, put a lockbox on it. And they're going to like, you know, or they're going to maybe show up and sit on the couch and say, here's the price per foot of the house. Here's the square footage. Here's how many bedrooms there are. Let me know if you have any questions. Do you want a salesperson or somebody that, so you just have to say, I work for my money and I'm, and I'm, and I have value. And then you say, here are my results. And then you show them what you've sold. Love it. Now, not to say that you can't, if, look, if it's, there are 
fighting over a half a point and everyone's going to willing to do it for 2% and you're at two and a half percent and just go for the 2%. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So Josh, I would love to move on to topic number two, Victoria, we see your question, but that is a perfect question for the next topic we get into, which is marketing do's and don'ts. So marketing, obviously, you now have the listing. It is the second most important thing once you've locked in the listing. Can we talk about where do you believe that your marketing dollars should be spent? Is it videos? People are doing the virtual tours, the drones, the mailers, the cards, the personal letters, the events. What of that is kind of important and should be prioritized? And what of that do you think is too much? Is that a sliding scale? Does it change between properties and price points? Give us a sense of what you believe in, what you stand behind, and what you would recommend to, I'm sure, some agents in the room who are constantly marketing their, their properties. Sure. Well, I mean, okay, let's take mailers. Mailers, for instance, I think are actually very effective with the caveat that you need to sell it, you need to send them to the same location over and over and over and over again, repetitively. If you sell a house or you get a listing and you just send one mailer there, and then you get another listing, you resell another house and you just send it to another location, you're throwing your money away. If somebody sees your name one time, it's you just wasted your money. You have to continue to send it to the same location over and over and over and over again. And people all the time say to me, oh, I know you, I get your mailers all the time. I get your mailers all the time. I get your mailers all the time. To the point where it's even almost annoying for them, but at least they see my name over and over and over again. So that's a great place to market yourself is through mailers. And as long, again, with the caveat that you're sending it to the same place over and over again. Um, I don't know if there's a tremendous cost of, uh, with it, but, but you know, social media wise, I mean, you know, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, I mean, social media is a, is a, is a great marketing tool and that doesn't cost anything. I can tell you where not to spend your money anymore is probably print. I don't think anybody's looking at the LA Times. I used to spend a fortune with the LA Times. I do, you know, uh, eight pages in a row and, you know, that's thousands and thousands of dollars, but to be honest with you, I don't know how many people are actually looking at the physical hard copies of the LA Times anymore. That's not to say that you can't, you know, maybe advertise at latimes.com. People are looking at it digitally, but print, I would say no. Right. Okay. So it sounds like mailers are the way to go as long as you're being incredibly consistent and just constantly sending them out so that they constantly see your name. Print ads seem to be obsolete at this point. So you do stand behind social media. We will get into topic number three, which is more about personal branding as a broker and which platforms you think are, are great for that. Um, in terms of, and this, I don't know if you would consider this marketing, but definitely part of listing is staging. Do you think staging is tremendously important? Absolutely. Do you, is that There's a reason the stagers are in business and they make so much money. I mean, Staging is a must, in my opinion, unless, for example, like if a house is a complete piece of crap and it's literally falling apart, it doesn't matter how great the furniture looks you put in there, it's not going to make a difference. So that's when I'd steer away from that. If you have a house that's immaculate and it's designer perfect and the seller, you know, is asking you to sell the house and, and, and you, there's no reason to stage it. It's really when your house is more just, you know, kind of, you know, it's pretty, it's whatever, and it's bland, but you know, and that's when you add color and paintings and, and furniture. And, 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 and by the way, the, the owner pays for that. Not the, uh, if, if an owner ever asks you to pay for the stage and you should just run for those hills you know, or, or if you have enough cash flow, you could say, that's fine. I'll pay all upfront the cost, but I get it back at the end of the sale, but you have to give me a long enough of a listing agreement that I know that, you know, I'm selling the house. And if it doesn't sell for some reason, um, you need to reimburse me for those costs because that would be, you know, annoying to, you know, lose the listing and then you get burned for the cost of staging. Right. Gotcha. Okay. So staging we think is important if it's kind of the right candidate. If it's something that totally speaks for itself, not as necessary. If it's a dumpy tear down and a developer is going to come buy it, don't waste your time or money on the stage. I'm a waste of time. What do you think about, you know, I'm sure all of us watch million dollar listing. We watch all of these fun shows about real estate and brokers. We see these parties with drinks and elaborate, you know, 
one thing or another, how effective do you think that those are? Is that something that is real? Is that the very Hollywood version of selling a property? What do you think about that? Waste of time and waste of money. Nobody's showing up to a party to have drinks and cheese and wine and whatever. And then they're going to go spend $10 million on a house. It's a waste of time. What brokers do often is they offer that uh, to clients like, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And it's usually just to promote themselves. It's a complete waste of time and money. And I hate to say that because you know, I'm throwing a lot of my competitors under the bus, I guess, technically. But, but I mean, the reality is like, have you ever heard of somebody walk in for cheese and wine and then they, they buy the house? No. What happens <laughs> if you're looking to buy a house, you go on Zillow, or you go on Trulia, you look at the MLS, you look at whatever, and you find a house and you go and you schedule an appointment with your, with your, with your client. I mean, me being that person who moseys into Sunday open houses for like the free sparkling water totally agrees with everything that you just said. I will go right. eat the snacks. And today I have not bought any of those homes, but I have had many free snacks and, and bottled water. So understood on that front. Um, I do want to bring up Victoria. I know you had asked about marketing. I'd love to bring you up on the stage. Unmute yourself, please. Your camera is now off. Just tap the camera and then also the microphone button. Maybe we can bring Diego up while Victoria Diego, you're a return camera back on. I've seen you a couple of times. You're at Douglas <laughs> Elman. That's right. Yes. Remember I offered you a job. You never, you never called me back. <laughs> no, that would have never happened. Um, yeah, no, I, you, I've seen you briefly in the lobby and whatnot, but um, yeah, no, I was just curious uh, what your opinion is on the, you know, I see them on at the office up at the front desk, the, the big red MLS caravan magazines. Do you feel like those get a lot of eyes on them? Is that something worth well, investing in? I, it's funny you ask that because I haven't looked at one of those in years, but that really stopped during COVID. The caravan magazines were like the Bible for brokers for a hundred years. Like it was every Tuesday, you open up the caravan magazine and you look and see, you know, what's open and whatnot. It was a big deal. We, I'd always take out full pages. I have not put an ad in the caravan magazine and I don't even remember the last time. In fact, last time I looked at it, it was like this thin. But also that could also be because things are digital today. You can look at it online and maybe people aren't, you know, looking at the actual paper version. So I don't know if it's because of COVID and, and open houses for brokers stopped or if it's because print is just out and people can just look at it online. Right. So the, I guess the answer to your question is no, but maybe you should advertise things for brokers caravan on, uh, online. I'm trying to think. It doesn't seem like, I, I really, honestly, we haven't been doing a lot of caravans in a long time. I kind of feel like it went out of style. Yeah. Well, let me know when you want me to come host an open house for you. I'll make myself available. All right. All right. We're doing a little professional matchmaking on these sessions. This is getting juicy. Um, let's bring up Ashley J. Ashley, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Oh, there you go. Hey, Josh, um, with just continuing what you're saying with open houses, you know, are they worthwhile even without the fanfare at all for you? Or is it really just a way to find buyers? Um, you know, I generally, I put a lot of my junior agents on open houses. I think it's a great way for them to meet buyers because if the mm -hmm. buyers are not interested in purchasing that house, then the person sitting in the open house can go sell them something else. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's also important to have an open house, a Sunday open house, because you're going to get a lot of buyers, even though you get a lot of neighbors, but you also get mm -hmm. a lot of buyers walking through. So yeah, I think that that's something that should never end. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, wonderful. If anyone has any other marketing questions, please feel free to pop those into the chat bar. Otherwise, I think we'll move on to our third topic, which is building your personal brand as a broker. So the first thing I want to ask is what kind of inspired your personal brand? What is the perception that you hope that others have? And what is kind of like the Josh Flag brand that you want to have out there and how and what kind of informed that? Um. 
I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I just kind of always done my own thing. I just, my brand is a representation of who I am. It's, it's just, um, I don't know, it's luxury and it's, and it's high end and it's, um, I don't really know how to answer that. I, I, I am, I don't know how to answer that one. I, I, I guess, I, you know, I think I, it sounds like it was just so effortless for you that uh, your brand is really just who you are. And it wasn't yeah. as much of a thought exercise of, okay, let me figure out who I want to be and put that image out there. It's just really authentic to who you are. Yeah. It's just, I really didn't put a thought process into it. It's just who I am. I guess if you know, someone's really into sports or something like that, they should, their brand should be targeted toward athletes. I mean, my brand has just always been, um, I, just, I don't know. It's just I out, out of the womb. I don't know. Um, and how important do you think that, you know, personally, I see a lot of Instagram accounts now with brokers who just focus on mid-century or just focus on, you know, a specific type of architecture or a specific style of home. Do you think that that gives you an edge as an agent or as a, as a broker to have a specific expertise? Or are you kind of about, let me get as many listings as I can? Or do you think that there's more to it beyond just signing as many listings as you can? Um, I, I would probably go with the latter. I think it's, I wouldn't limit yourself. I think if you have a listing and it's good, put it up. I, I don't, I wouldn't limit yourself. I don't. And also, I guess if you like specialize as a architectural house person or this kind of a person, then you're not going to get other kinds of listings. So I, I would say I'm, yeah, I, I would keep it broad. I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit yourself. I think you might be missing business that way. Awesome. Yeah. I think that that is something that a lot of people have been wondering just because there are so many different types of brokers out there and there just are so many people out there. How do you set yourself apart? How do you differentiate yourself? You mentioned that you do think social media and Instagram is important. Well, you are can there still make other- good content. I mean, you can great make great content. You don't have to specify, I'm going to be a special, a special, a specialist in English tutor houses. Like Mm -hmm. you can still make great content with whatever houses, like it's really about the content and it's about your personality. And if you have interesting things, I think that's what people are attracted to. I think they're more interested that I don't think people are just, Oh, I'm only looking at mid-century houses. I I don't like that. So I think to that point too, you are in particular kind of this multi-hyphenate and beyond just real estate and being a broker, you have a lot of your, you know, you have hands in a lot of other pots. How much of being a broker today do you think needs to be kind of exploring and putting yourself out there in other ways, whether it is a content moment or whether it is being a part of another type of business? What do you kind of think about that? Um, keep going with the question. Like, for example, did you, when you joined the cast of the show, did you think, you know, this is going to make my career? Did you think this is just something kind of fun that I think would be an interesting experience to have? How did that kind of help you with your actual career as an individual versus your career as a broker? Or are the two well, things they I think work hand in hand? A, I think it was a no-brainer. I mean, I, I, the show was on for a year and it was a different format. There was like 14 different agents. It wasn't a show about three, you know, top tier real young real estate agents. It wasn't like that. And I watched the show. I was like, okay, this is kind of interesting, but I can make this better. So why not, you know, call up Bravo directly, get an interview with them. And that's what I did. I went there, they filmed me. They sent a tape to New York to Andy Cohen. They approved me. And then I was on the show. I mean, it was a no brainer. It's like, I mean, it's such great publicity at that show. I mean, you know, agents spend thousands of dollars on marketing themselves and I can do this, you know, f- for free on television. So, um, but I'm, I'm a bad example because I mean, not everybody has the opportunity of having a TV show. Right. But the goal with the show was I'm going to do this to advance my career as a broker yeah for sure it wasn't just like oh I want to be on tv and be famous right. I right. mean it was it came along with it but it wasn't right. like it wasn't like what my aspiration was it was like oh this is a great tool to sell houses so like being a broker and selling homes is still very much your passion and your number one priority and your you know career 
Oh yeah. Sometimes people actually ask me, it's so, so silly. Somebody just, do you, do you actually sell houses or is that just for the show? I'm like, no, that's what I do for a living. This right. is just the show documents it. Um, Monda has another question. Let's bring you back up. Hello. Are there any specific or new video marketing trends or ideas that you're into right now? When you say video marketing, what do you mean? Like, I mean, there are so many real estate agents that are doing like home video tours, but they're doing a, they're putting their face at the beginning of it and like kind of narrating it a little bit or like the funny stuff, or is there anything like any specific type of like video stuff that agents are doing that you like and that like you think is cool? Yeah. I mean, I think anybody who's, I mean, if you have a really funny personality and you can like look at touring a house is not generally the most interesting thing on earth, but if you have a great personality and you can be funny and you can be entertaining, you can be witty. I mean, that's really what the person's tuning in to watch. I mean, yes, the house porn also, but but yeah, if, if, but that's, you know, you have to have the personality to do that. So you just like the authentic stuff, just be yourself and. Yeah. Exciting. As long as you're entertaining, if you're not, I mean, you know, I'm not going to watch the rest of the video. Got it. Fair. Um, thank you, Monda. Victoria, we see that you're back. If you turn your camera on, we can bring you up on stage. If you just want to tap the camera button. In the meantime, we can bring Ashley back up. Hi, Ashley, I guess. Okay. Hi, just another question um, from what you were talking about before. So, I mean, I one of the things I like about you on the show is you have a different personality, I think, than the average realtor. You know, you're fun, you're quirky, you, you know, you tell stories. And I'm wondering, do you feel like you win a lot of business by being different? And if you do, since you have a team, do you try to hire people that kind of are similar to you? You know, people can't work with, like, do people kind of seek you out for that? Um, I don't know why they seek me out, but I know that generally the people that come work for me, um, they're usually newbies and they're getting into business. And generally what they're doing is they're looking to be with me because they know that if they go on a listing appointment by themselves and they don't have much experience under their belt, they're not going to get the listing. So I go with them on the listing and then I guess, you know, my personality or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. I lend that to the table and that's why they bring me on and that's why I'm an asset to them. But it's not like I'm generally seeking out like quirky, funny people. I, I just like fun people that, but, but most importantly, people that doesn't really matter. You could be boring as, you know, I don't really, you could be the most boring person on it. If you know how to close a deal, you go, you close a deal. That's what I want. The, the, that's what I want for the people working working for me okay so you mainly look for skill you know more than like a certain personality I look for people that are a social because let's be real uh, to get business you need to know people you need to be out yeah. there you need to socialize um i look for people that know their shit like people that really <laughs> are understanding of the market and are knowledgeable yeah. understand all the streets understand all the pricing you know I generally don't hire people that just come in and go, oh, hi, I want to, you know, be a big broker. And um, mm -hmm. I went to USC and I think I know a lot of people and I don't know anything about real estate. Like that's generally not like mm -hmm. what I'm interested in. They have to, yes, great. They went to USC. They have a lot of rich people. They have contacts. Like that's great. Love that. But you also have to have a passion and a desire about real estate because if you're not passionate about you, you're not going to be good at it. The reason I'm really successful and the reason that I'm, you know, one of the top brokers in the country, if not the world, is because I know my shit better than anybody. Mm -hmm. And and that's one thing I can, in the, look, I don't have a lot of talents, but I can tell you that one thing I do know more about anybody is is houses. I can tell you, I, I know my shit and, and the people mm -hmm. I like hire are the ones that know their shit. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So Caitlin asks a very interesting question. I'd love to bring Caitlin up. This is about marketing off-market listings, which is not something that we have discussed. Caitlin, do you want to ask Josh your question? Yes. So of course, when the house is not on the MLS, you have less chances of a ton of people putting in multiple offers, driving up the price and whatnot. Um, what has been some ways that you market off-market listings to still get the best price for your seller? Well, 
generally, you're not really even allowed to do that anymore. They've kind of stopped pocket listings in Los Angeles. You're not really allowed to market things off market, to be honest with you. So it's hard to answer that question. Um, but, you know, where places that you are allowed to still do it, um, I would do an email blast out to all the top brokers in the area. I would tell a few uh, uh, brokers or a few clients, because once you tell one person, everybody finds out within five days, mm -hmm. spreads like wildfire. So it's really not that hard to market a, a house off market, but email blast is good if the seller gives you permission to do it. Um, but that's about as much as you can do. Okay, good to know, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Caitlin. Lee has a question. Let's please bring up Lee. And you are muted, Lee. I see that. Hello, how are you? Hi, Josh. Hi. So when you try to directly market a listing to brokers who operate a lot in that same price point, which platform do you like to use to get directly to that? I don't understand the question. So I, like, hey, my listing's coming on the market in two days, you're gonna love it. You know, it's this price here, let me give the stats. Do you like to do a direct phone call? Do you? Like to send them text? Do you like to do oh, some video? Um, yeah, you could text a bunch, like text the top 10 brokers, call the 10 top brokers, email the top 10 brokers, and then if you can, do an email blast. Okay. So all of it. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. We have Victoria back. Let's get Victoria up here. Please unmute yourself. Just tap the microphone button. Okay. We will get there with Victoria. Okay, so market to top 50 agents selling at that price point, ideas of paper handouts and party with brokers. Okay, is it a question or a statement? Are these like notes from the session? We want to expand on these things. Okay, parties with brokers we've established, I think is useless. Uh, idea of paper handouts for agents. Yeah, I mean, you can print a bunch of paper handouts and leave them at, you know, when, when, when brokers come to the house or clients come, I mean, it's, yeah, that's a, I mean, it's not an expensive marketing tool, but it's something you should do. Uh, and market to the top 50 agents selling at that price point. Yeah, of course. Reach out to everybody and anybody. I have a question about that. Obviously, there is a little bit of healthy competition between you and these brokers who are selling in the realm of, you know, the types of listings that you're selling. But does it ever get because you also have to be friendly with these people because they can be bringing you buyers? Does that dynamic ever get awkward how do you kind of juggle being friendly but also they're your competition but you also kind of need them how how does that dynamic work yeah i mean it's it's competitive and so you and you're doing business with one another so it can get sometimes it can get a little intense but i mean i guess you know when i started in the business i guess my biggest mistake was i was cocky and arrogant and i was disrespectful to most other agents because i just wanted to be at the top of my game and just be you know number one which i wasn't i just started in the business and so i burnt a lot of bridges so i guess the moral of the story here is that you should really maintain great relationships with all the top brokers because you're going to need you know buyers they come they go the agents that you work with they're in the business forever so you really have to maintain good relationships with as many as possible unless they're just complete fucking assholes <laughs> then we can blacklist them okay so dan is back with another great question let's bring dan up hello again yeah i'm just curious josh what percent of your business i don't know if you can track this but what percent of your business comes from sellers versus buyers are you consciously trying to shape it are you trying to be 50 50 or no 50 50 i mean that uh, i just put one in escrow it was a seller i just put one in escrow it's a buyer that was a seller that was a seller that was a buy it's 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 honestly i could have a year where it's mostly buyers and most of the year it's just, it's just there's no rhyme or reason to it Cool. Are you a broker? I, you know, I think I'm the only one in here that's not, but I'm, I'm starting to think in that. I just sold a company and I'm 
kind of bored and I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Weren't you on last time? I was, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah. We have failed to buy a house. I live in Larchmont now, and my wife and I have tried and failed to buy a house in LA for about eighteen months. So you better get on the on the you know this train is leaving the station. You better get on it sooner than later. I know, I know. I've got to reach out to you. What's the best? Can I to like Josh hire you as a broker? Com. What is it? Josh at joshflag.com. I told you that last time, but you still have no. You didn't tell me. You didn't give me your email address. But okay, I will email you. Okay. If you come cool. back next time and you still haven't emailed me, we're going to kick you off. I think Dan is a full series ticket purchaser. Am I right, Dan? Uh, uh, I Yeah, of course. I thought that was the only option. Yeah, I saw Josh's name and it was an Insta buy. Yep. So we will see Dan on part three of the five part series. Yeah, and I might get kicked out, but no, I'm, I'm writing that email. <laughs> oh, we won't kick you out, Dan. <laughs> uh, um, cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dan. We have Victoria back with another question, or we're not gonna we're not gonna bring Victoria. Okay, we're not gonna bring Victoria up, oh, but we're gonna read your back. question. Okay. Other marketing ideas for a new construction by about six hundred square feet too small. So, if we're understanding correctly, beautiful new construction, but on the smaller side. So we're looking for some creative ways to bolster the marketing strategy. She's nodding. So I feel like that's that. Um, well, I guess, you know, it makes me think about a time when I was selling this house on Benedict Canyon and it was, it was an $8 million house and everybody kept coming in and saying, oh, it's on Benedict, it's busy. I'll give you 7 million. And I said, they ain't selling it for $7 million, but I'll tell you what, why don't we walk across the street to the thousand block of Roxbury and I'll sell you a beautiful house for 16 million if you don't think it's good enough for you. you all you have to do is spin it. So it's 600 square feet or sm too small or whatnot. You say, no problem, that's fine. You wanna spend a lot more money? I'll sell you something a lot bigger. This isn't your price range and you just kind of give it back to them like that. That's the way to sell something. You don't, you never wanna feel like a salesman. You wanna make them feel like they're coming to you. So it's all about positioning. Correct. That's the key to being a good salesman. I think across every industry that applies. So absolutely. Um, we have Manda and Diego. Why don't we bring both of them up together? Some more questions about marketing. And maybe we can pop their questions up on screen. Let's pop their questions up. Great. So Diego is asking about printing collateral door hangers. I've never seen, oh, door hangers. Okay. Um, and then creative marketing ideas from Monda. So I think we just want to have a great conversation about some creative, fresh marketing ideas. You guys can oh. both unmute yourselves and we can have a little Conversation. Notepads, I think, waste of time. I think people just literally use them as notepads. Door hangers, I think, are tacky. I, I told you, do mailers and have a mess, have something for them to look at. I just sold this house or something to that effect, something to look at, not just a lined piece of paper that has your logo on it. Like, who cares? <clears throat> Manda, what was your question? Um, it's just Manda. There's nothing fancy about it. It's like a Manda with no A. But so I have a um, like a luxury building view lot that I'm getting ready to list in a couple of weeks. And when I refer to it as luxury, um, it's up in the Eagle Foothills, which is a small city outside of Boise. But we're listing at 1.6 just for the dirt, and um, we're we've been challenged from the sellers to get really really creative on how we can market it. So. Any, we will yeah we'll have drone footage like the whole shebang so do a drone do a little video and do it and why don't you put up a, a stake or something what do you call it like a um um like a sign with a picture of what the renderings are going to be on the property yeah we're going to do that it'll be like a four by eight like really large sign that'll have like a, a couple of different options there's a couple of different places where you could put a building pad on the lot. So is it entitled? Um, yes. Okay. So shovel ready, entitled, comes with plans and permits and the and the uh, architectural drawings and whatnot. 
you know, that's what people are looking for. There's a lot of value and you should emphasize it with the buyers that today it takes a long time to get plans and permits and the cost and the time and whatnot. There's a lot of value to that. One thing that, yeah, I totally agree. One thing that we were thinking about doing, I'd love to have your input on this is like coming up with like a builder box and putting all the marketing collateral in a box and delivering it to like the top uh, luxury custom builders in the Boise area. Um, okay, the collateral, what do you mean? Uh, like a copy of like potential renderings, um, like some photos, like a marketing brochure, like what. Why don't you take it a take it a step further? Why don't you get um, some samples from the marble, the wood people, whatever, and put little chips of like the wood sample and color, or the marble, or something in the box, and so and along with it, and so they can get an idea of like what it comes along with. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Love that. Thank you. You're welcome. I want a part of that commission. <laughs> got it also are you hiring because i wouldn't move to la to work for you <laughs> you know your shit and you know your stuff about the la market yes sweet <laughs> so we have a few minutes left if anyone wants to pop in some last questions or comments i think this has been a very very informative session I am looking forward to the next one. We have Alicia. She is not a broker. She's a real estate attorney. Alicia, not if you think this has been helpful and exciting. Do you want to come up on stage and talk to us? <laughs> Thank you, Dan. I will be back next week. Alicia on stage. Great. Unmute yourself, please. There, can you hear me? I'm sorry. It's been very informative. Um, I represent a lot of real estate agents. So I thought this would um, actually enlighten me more about my clients and make me understand them better. So thank you so much. Uh, I do have a question for Josh though. Um, and you touched up on something that you said I thought was really important about keeping relationships going. And then maybe, you know, in the past you had acted a certain way and maybe it was better to be nicer. Um, aside from that, which is mistakes that we all make, um, how do you handle making a mistake? And um, what do you tell your clients? And do you ever fall on the sword for something that maybe someone working under you did? Uh, I guess you have to just admit fall and take blame for it. I mean, I don't, well, I mean, financially, if you have, if you're with a brokerage, you have, you have a, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, errors and emissions agreement, uh, a, a contract which protects you. So if there's ever a legal or a financial, um, if you get sued or you actually make a mistake, the brokerage would pick that up. That's what you're supposed to pay for over time. But if it's not about that and you just actually screw up, I would just say, look, you know what? I don't make a lot of mistakes in this business, but you know, every once in a while it happens. I'm owning up to it. I want to apologize. This was my mistake. What else can you do? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Alicia, do you think any of your clients are like Josh or is he um, just one of a kind? Josh is one of a kind. I, the things that I represent on, sometimes even the best brokers just didn't see coming and it's just sometimes a little bit unlucky. Um, sometimes it's about something wrong with the property that no one ever noticed, you know, and sometimes it's actually about two uh, brokers fighting over commission, <laughs> things like that. So, thanks, so like, Alicia. That was I was going to say, I'm in Houston, for us. Um, houses were four hundred thousand dollars less than houses in California. So, move to Texas. <laughs> A lot of people are. Thanks. Thank you, guys. I think we will wrap up tonight's sessions, and of course, please come back for session number three. Thank you all.